Hello, everybody, and either welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Well, we certainly do not lack for things to talk about this week on this week's weekly roundup, obviously. So let's go ahead and start kind of where we left off on the last weekly roundup. And that is that I believe that Friday, it was last Friday, which it feels like it was about 15 years ago, but I, I swear to you it was about a week ago. Trump announced that he is indeed calling a national emergency for border wall funding, and he is also signing a crappy bill that made its way through Congress. So we kind of got the worst of both worlds here. We got a crappy spending bill and a stupid national emergency. Now, on the national emergency front, it seems like the idea is that the funds for the border wall that are not in this spending bill will be taken from the Department of Defense, which... It, it, it's all kind of up in the air right now about how exactly this is going to go down, but that seems to be the idea on that side. On the other side, there is a spending bill that has been approved, and within the spending bill, it allows for $1.375 billion for the border fence wall thing, whatever you want to call it at this point, because in this bill, it also does specify that it cannot be a wall. Like it can't be a concrete wall. It has to be the bollard slats, the, you know, the metal slats that we, we've kind of shifted away from the wall to the slats. So this codifies that it has to be that. Like it cannot be a solid wall that you cannot see through. It also allows for another $725 million for technology upgrades along the border. Um, there is $3.1 billion in here for foreign health services. Which is interesting because obviously, first and foremost, that's way more than was actually allotted for the slat wall building. Second of all, this, as far as from what I can tell, is meant to address a certain situation that is kind of still up in the air pending. And I know I've talked about this before, but the idea still is that asylum seekers coming through Mexico will be staying in Mexico while their asylum proceedings are going forth while they're waiting for their dates and everything. So this money is meant to help ease that situation, to help provide housing and healthcare services and stuff like that for the people who are staying in Mexico. That being said, it's still kind of working its way through the courts of whether or not the whole stay in Mexico plan is even legal so uh, it's it's interesting that they allotted that much money for that. They seem to be going on the assumption that it will be deemed legal. I don't know. It's, it's a very weird situation. And the bill also says that there are certain places along the border that this wall cannot be built. Basically, it pretty much eliminates everything other than along the Rio Grande Valley sector. So... A lot of the a lot of the protected lands that a lot of people were worried about, like wildlife sanctuaries, the butterfly sanctuary, stuff like that, this bill says that you cannot build the slat wall in those places. And a couple of other notable spots is it also allows for four hundred and fifteen million dollars for humanitarian aid, seventy seven million dollars for opioid equipment, which I'm assuming to mean that is going to be like searching for drugs, basically. And it also allows for 1,200 new Customs and Border Patrol agents. However, this bill does not allow for any more funding or personnel for ICE. So they are ramping up Border Patrol, but they are not ramping up ICE. Which is interesting because it always seems to be that the focus whenever we talk about immigration is on ICE. And I think a lot of people forget that ICE's job is to work within the United States. They don't patrol the border. Like ICE has nothing to do with border enforcement. That's that's border patrol. ICE deals with immigrants that are already in the country as far as arresting and deporting them. So it's interesting that they're ramping up border patrol and not ramping up ICE. I don't know entirely how to take that, but it was, I would have almost expected it to be the other way around. But, I mean, we shall see how this how this boils out. And, of course, of course, because it is a spending bill, there's 
pork in it, obviously, and shit that does not even remotely belong in this bill. Like, there's there's money going to Israel, Ukraine, and Jordan. Like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? It allots a billion dollars to the Smithsonian, which, what the fuck does the Smithsonian have anything to do with immigration or anything that this bill is supposed to be addressing? But, uh, of course, it's, it's a spending bill in Congress, so you know it's going to be full of pork, as per usual. And then, on top of that, we do have Trump declaring the national emergency. So, it's kind of the worst of both worlds right now. Like, we we got pretty much all the shit, instead of, like, half the shit that we thought we were going to get. And here's the thing. Moving back to the national emergency thing. First and foremost... And I know some of you will give me shit for saying this, but this is not a national emergency. There is no reason, none, to be calling a national emergency in this situation other than Trump wants his shiny toy and Congress won't give him his shiny toy. So he's going to declare a national emergency and take money from another department, which feel however you want to feel about the Department of Defense. Obviously, they're way, way, way overfunded in the first place. I know. I know. But stay with me. Taking money from another department to pay for your little pet project. Like, that's not okay. At all. And Nancy Pelosi has already come out and said that the next time there is a Democratic president, they will use this precedent to declare a national emergency on climate change. And they'll declare a national emergency on gun control. So thanks, Trump. Thanks for opening that fucking door so that the next Democratic president can declare a national emergency so that they can get their pet projects funded too. Thanks, asshole. That's going to work out so great for everybody. And that's really the big takeaway from this is like now that that bell has been rung, it will be used again. It's like it was like nuking the filibuster. Like, it will come back and bite you in the ass. And this will come back and bite everybody in the ass. Because this is now a precedent. Now a president can say, I'm going to declare a national emergency because I didn't get my way, basically. And I couldn't get what I wanted through Congress. So I'm going to say, fuck it. And just declare a national emergency and take the funds from somewhere else and get the thing that I want. Which that is just so bad. So, so incredibly bad. Not just because of how it will be used in the future. And make no mistake, it will be used by the next president and the president after that and the president after that. But this is also just a flagrant, flagrant violation of the separation of powers. Like this is completely just the executive branch trying to completely do an end run around the legislative branch because the legislative branch didn't give you the thing that you wanted. Like that's not okay. But... There are legal challenges being mounted against this right now. I think, I forget how many states. I want to say six states have already filed suit against this. And it did come out today that the House Democrats have passed a resolution terminating the national emergency, which obviously that's just the House. It's not gone through the Senate or anything. And again, even if they did, Trump could probably just veto it. But it's just, it's such, it's such a dangerous, dangerous precedent to set and over something so fucking stupid so stupid like this oh my god I I still I still maintain and I will I will stay on this hill this wall ain't getting built I'm telling you guys now this wall is not fucking getting built and the amount of damage that everybody from Trump to Republicans to the Democrats are willing to inflict over this stupid wall that's never gonna fucking happen is insane. Like, this is nuts. Like, can somebody please stop this? Like, we just had a government shutdown for over a month. And while I wish the government would shut down permanently, there were people affected by that. Like, I, I will say that, okay, people went without pay, whatever, we've discussed it. But the fact that after all of this, after all the screeching, after everything, this is what we ended up with? Are you kidding me? Like, how much, how much damage are all these people willing to do over this dumbass wall that ain't getting built? Like, it's just, it's wild to me. Like, I cannot, 
I, I, I'm having problems understanding what I'm watching here with this. But obviously this is something that is still unfolding and who knows? I don't, I don't know how this is going to end up at this point. But yes, we are still technically under state of national emergency because we need to build the border wall for something that's not a national emergency. Not a national emergency. So anyway, moving on. Now to discuss the Jesse Smollett situation, which this story has completely fallen in on itself since the last time I spoke on it, which was a couple of weeks ago when the story first broke. And even since the last weekly roundup, like this story has just imploded and it's just ugly and nasty and dirty and basically where we're at at this point. And I'll try to back this up to kind of give a little bit of a timeline for people that haven't been following this. This all kind of started to fall apart probably about the beginning-ish of this week where, I mean, obviously I had questions before, other people had questions before, but then the story kind of started to fall apart because they had taken two men into custody who they thought had perpetrated this attack on Smollett. Turns out the two men that they took in custody were, first of all, black, like African, like Somali, black, like black, black. And they knew him, like they had been on Empire, they had worked on set, one of them was his personal trainer. So they take these men into custody, Chicago PD takes them into custody, questions them, and then releases them. So at this point, once they've released the brothers, they, and when I say brothers, I mean they're actual brothers, I'm not making a racial comment there. But they released the brothers, and then that's where everybody started to be like, Okay, what the fuck now? Because once that happened, Chicago PD started to... I don't know if they were intentionally leaking stuff or if it was just leaking out anyway. News started coming out that when they had spoken to these two men, that essentially they told them that they were paid to stage this attack. And so... Once that came out, a lot of people started asking more questions, which begot more questions. Smollett went on Good Morning America to maintain his innocence, which after that happened, Chicago PD kind of dropped the hammer on them, where they pretty much just fleeced everything. And just today, we are at the point where Chicago PD has officially gone on record saying that this was a hoax and that... He that Smollett did pay these two men thirty five hundred dollars via check. He wrote a fucking check. Like who leaves a paper trail on this? Anyway, basically he paid them a amount of money to stage this attack, and they found surveillance footage of the two men going to a hardware store and buying the rope and the ski masks and the red hats and everything. And so now at this point they have arrested him for felony disorderly conduct, for filing a false police report. Um, as far as I know, there is still an open FBI investigation based off of the the letter that he had received in the mail before this attack, which apparently that was staged too. And here's here's the gross part. Here's the part that really, really bothers me. Like, there's a lot of things about this that really bothers me, but the more I think about this particular point, this really fucking bothers me. The story that Chicago PD is putting out is that Smollett was not happy with the amount of money he was getting paid from Fox to be on the show Empire. So he staged this this hoax, this this fake hate crime in order to gain sympathy, I suppose, in order to what I can only assume would be to try to browbeat Fox into giving him more money, which for what it's worth, he is already making $65,000 per episode times 18 episodes a year, which puts you a little over $1.1 million a year. (sighs) I'm, I'm sorry. What? You, you staged a fucking hate crime. Like, and, and this is, this is what bothers me. 
this shit actually happens. And that's why when I first heard the story, I still held out like a 5% chance of, yeah, this is completely and utterly legit because gay people do still get attacked in this country. Black people do still get attacked in this country. And to make a hoax about you being a gay black man, being beaten up and lynched and having bleach thrown on you, it's it's vile. It's fucking sick. Like, this is shit that happens. Like, you do not get to appropriate someone else's experiences just so you can try to get a fucking raise. Are you kidding me? Are you for real? Like, that is just disgusting in ways that I cannot begin to describe. Like, that's just... You, you appropriated somebody else's pain, somebody else's experiences to try to... For for nothing to try to get a raise, you just go ask for a fucking raise. You don't have to do all this shit. You don't have to put other people in this position. You don't have to cause the Chicago PD and the FBI to waste time and money on this. You don't have to put into question now every time that somebody wants to get somebody gets attacked. Like every time now that a black person or a gay person or God forbid a gay black person gets legitimately attacked, now the whole thing is going to be like, oh, well, are did you really get attacked? Or are you trying to, are you working some kind of angle? It's like every time somebody falsely reports rape, like you make it that much fucking harder for anybody who has been legitimately attacked to report and to be taken seriously. Like, go fuck yourself with that. Like, that's disgusting. But the other thing that bothers me about this and... I touched on this in the last episode when I was talking to Art about the idea that victimization is a social currency right now. And it's apparently very, very valuable. Like, obviously, I knew that. I didn't think anybody would ever take it to this level. And John McWhorter wrote a great piece for Atlantic, and I'll link it in the show notes. But he was talking about how this concept is like social vic- or victimization as social currency. And that not only is that a thing, but apparently it's more valuable than having actual, just like normal fame or money. Because clearly Smollett viewed being a victim as more important and more valuable to him as a person than his own fame and his own wealth. Like, what the fuck have we done, people? Like, what the hell is going on in this country? It's so... The the victimization thing, It's this has got to stop. Like, this has got to stop. And it's not like Smollett is the first person to perpetrate a hoax or to play the victim in order to gain sympathy, in order to gain notoriety. I would really like him to be the last. I know he won't be because this is the environment that we live in now where victimization is everything. Being a victim is the best fucking thing you can be in this country right now because that gives you gravitas. That means now all of a sudden you are taken seriously because look at me. I am a victim of this thing. So now you should pay attention to me and you should listen to my words and you should give me all this attention for being a victim. And I'm just like, I'm so old. I can remember when being a victim was a bad thing. Like that was not something that you went around talking about. But now it's like a badge of honor. Like people, I mean, this man just paid to perpetrate a hoax to pretend like he was a victim of a fucking hate crime. That's insane. If you went back in time, like 20 years and told a black person that 20 years in the future, there will be a black man and a gay man who will pay money to be put in this position, to be paid money Because this will be something that is of value. They would look at you like you were nuts. Like, I don't even know what to say about this. And the the last disturbing thing to me about this story as it stands right now. I mean, obviously, this has just been... This has been an absolute fucking dumpster fire. But once it was publicly obvious that this story was a hoax, like even before Chicago PD officially confirmed it, but everybody kind of, there was enough information out there in the ether where everybody could kind of draw the obvious conclusion. People started coming out, like people center left, left, prominent people 
started coming out and saying that they too had their questions about this story, but that they dared not speak them out loud or tweet them or post them or write a story about them because of the environment that we live in and because we are dealing with a gay black man and to question him would have invited just insane, vile, smearing attacks. And I, I, I filed this one under, I don't like it, but I get it. Like, I don't like that anybody self-censored, self-censored on this one because it's, it, it was, to me, in my mind, like, it was fine to ask questions. Like, I never gave it even remotely a second thought as long, as far as those lines are concerned about not asking questions or not raising concerns because we are dealing with a gay black man until other people started saying that they held back, like they pulled their punches. And... Even Katie Herzog, she wrote a piece about it, and in her piece, she wrote that she had written a piece prior to that that was asking questions and somewhat critical about Smollett's story, and her editor spiked it. Like, I'm not okay with this. Like, I don't... I don't don't like where this is heading, because this is kind of intersectionality going horribly, horribly wrong and off the rails. Like, just because somebody is black and gay does not mean that they should get a free pass to just say whatever it is they want to say and put out whatever the fuck narrative they want to put out and nobody can question it. Like, that that really bothered me to see how many people came out and were like, yeah, I had questions off the rip too, but I couldn't say anything or I, I felt like I couldn't say anything for fear of what would happen to them professionally. Like, just the the absolute shitstorms that people start on Twitter and stuff like that. And I just... That that bothers me. I don't know how to get around that, but I think this is a good case example of how intersectionality has really permeated just everything. Like, people talk about, oh, it's just in this little bubble. It's just, you, you just see it on social media. It's like, no, people are dead ass conducting themselves around these ideas that because this was a gay black man who put forth a very fishy story that was, I mean, it was, it, it was a bit incredulous from the start. Like it, it, it was shady. It was shady as fuck, but that because of who was saying it, because of his race, because of his sexual orientation, certain people felt like they could not ask what would have been very legitimate questions to ask because of the reactions that they would have gotten to asking those questions. Like, that's not okay. Nobody gets to be above anybody else because of where they stand on the intersectionality ladder. Like, nobody gets to be sacrosanct. Nobody gets a free pass. And I I don't... I, I don't know how else to say this. It, it's just, it's, this, this is getting out of control. Like this situation, I think if there was one thing that we could take away from this is that this is getting this victimization culture and this intersectionality is getting completely fucking out of control. And really the last thing I want to talk about before I leave off of this topic, hopefully for forever, which is the timing of this. Now, A lot of people, when this story first dropped, completely ran with it on face value, did not ask any critical questions, just completely accepted the story as is. And I was like, did we not just have this fucking conversation? Did we not? It wasn't even two weeks after the Covington situation that everybody hauled off and did the same damn thing all over again. You went with what you were shown initially. You asked no critical questions. You put no critical thought into this. You just ran with the fucking story and blew it up. And I'm just like, we we just had this conversation about how you don't do that. Nobody learned anything. Nobody learned anything from Covington. And this story proves it. 
Like it's and and I get it. Like I know I know it's about clicks, people. I know it's about the clicks. It's about driving traffic to your website. It's about getting attention on the internet. I get it. But there has to be a point where you have to start valuing being correct over being first. Being first is getting a lot of people burned lately. And for what it's worth, touching back on the Covington thing, Nicholas Sandman, the MAGA hat kid, has, or, well, they, I say him, him, his parents, I'm assuming because he's still a minor, his team, have filed a lawsuit against Washington Post for libel and defamation for $250 million. They have released letters of intent that they plan on suing other publications and other journalists who ran with this story. I mean, when, at what point do you, as a journalist or as a a publication, stop this nonsense? Like, it's going to start costing you money. And Mark Hemingway did a great piece on this. I'll try to link it in the show notes, too, along with the McWhorter piece. Kind of detailing how the biggest enemy to the press right now is the press because of situations like this that they keep self-perpetrating. Like, you keep putting yourself in these situations where you want to be first and you rush to be first, but then you turn out to be wrong. And so you have to do, you have to issue corrections. You have to, you have to take down stories. You have to change them. Like at what point does this stop? And I am very interested to see what happens with the Sandman WAPO lawsuit. I mean, I'm, I'm 96% sure they'll settle out of court, but I would like this to actually go to court because I mean, I, I would like to see what the courts have to say about this particular situation because, as Hemingway points out in his piece, the courts are not always taking the side of journalists now the way they used to. Like, it was always considered by journalists that, like, you could pretty much say, publish, do whatever you want because of the First Amendment. And that environment seems to be shifting on the legal front. So... Like I said, I doubt this case will go to trial. I would like to see it go to trial because I would like to start seeing some kind of like legal framework set up around these sorts of things because that wasn't a story. That wasn't a story. But anyway, trying to move back to our our topics at hand, let's go ahead and move on to the third thing that we need to discuss today, which is that America's second favorite socialist has made it official. He's running. Yes, Bernie announced, I believe it was Tuesday morning. I'm recording this on a Thursday. But he had announced early that morning that he is indeed planning on running for the Democratic nomination for 2020. Which is interesting, first and foremost, because of the Bernie rule that I know I've discussed on here before, which is that in order to be a candidate for the Democratic nomination, you have to actually join the Democratic Party, which as so I'm assuming he has. I have heard that Vermont, the Vermont DNC is claiming him. Anyway, apparently he is now officially a Democrat now because that's what you have to do to run. And the reactions have been interesting online. Um, he actually raised in his first 24 hours, he raised six million dollars in donations, which first of all, is an insane amount of money to raise in 24 hours and also ensures that he will be in the debates that will be starting in June, I do believe. But yeah, so obviously he's, he's met the threshold for that. There have been two interesting camps that have evolved on the, the whole Bernie running thing. And that is those people who were Bernie supporters back in 2015, 2016, who are very happy to see him back and definitely support him. Obviously, he just raised a shit ton of money, so obviously he he has a lot of support. But on the other side, there are lefties who want Bernie to basically go sit his old white ass the hell down and shut up and let the women and the youngs run and get the nomination. And it's it's been fascinating to me to watch because 
it shows just how much things have changed since 2015 when he first ran. Like, if any of you remember, when he was running, he was like, he was the lefty demi demagogue. Like, everybody loved him. Loved Bernie. Everybody loved Bernie. Now there's people who want Bernie to go, like, die in a fire. So... It'll be interesting to see what happens to Bernie and which side really wins out. Like right now, just on name recognition and money alone, he just basically jumped to being the front runner. Like he just jumped ahead of Kamala. I, I will pronounce her name like that for forever now because that's how she she uh, she taught us all how to pronounce her name in a YouTube video. It's Kamala, Kamala. Yeah, that that was that video was painful. But anyway. It's, I don't know, the the whole Dem 2020 field is very fascinating to me because first of all, there's already way too many fucking people in it. And I'm thinking that Bernie joining is going to start causing other people to drop out. I, I think it's going to start calling the herd a lot earlier than any of this would normally be happening, which is another thing, like, because they are starting the debate cycle so, so early in this election cycle, people are having to announce so much earlier than they normally would have. Like, somebody like Bernie normally wouldn't have announced this early if it wasn't for having to be in these, to make sure that they're going to be eligible for these debates, because you either have to have X amount of polling numbers or have received Y amount of money, which he's, he's blown it out of the month out of the water money wise. So he doesn't have to worry about that. But normally somebody like Bernie, who already has that kind of name recognition, he would have waited until maybe April, May to announce that he's running because he doesn't need to have like a massive head start or anything. Like he's Bernie. Everybody already knows who he is. So the, the fact that this whole election cycle is starting so, so early makes me wonder, like, how is this going to pan out? Like, you cannot sustain this field for as long as it's going to need to be sustained. Like, and and just the, the whole Democratic, the, the whole primary debate scheme as it's set up right now, it, it just speaks to how fucking insane and how there are way too many people in this field. Because what they're doing is there's going to be like a, like a lottery kind of thing where everybody's name gets thrown in there. And then it's supposed to be, it's going to be like a two night thing. Like not everybody's going to debate everybody at the same time. So they're going to have like group A, group B. It's like, once you have to start getting to that point, you need to take a step back and figure out like, is this really a good idea? Like, do we really need all of these people? And also with Bernie joining the race, his platform is basically his, his, 2015 2016 platform is where the Democratic Party is right now. Like everybody is running on his platform. So, what I think will happen is because Bernie has been espousing these sorts of things for decades, like he's the OG on this, and everybody else is kind of like this Johnny come lately. How is everybody else going to differentiate themselves from Bernie? Like, because y'all are running on Bernie's platform, and now Bernie's running. So now you have to differentiate yourself from him. Like, I don't, I don't really know how this is going to shake out other than I, I don't, I don't, do you go further left? Do you go more centrist? Like, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, from what I've seen of the reaction to Howard Schultz and his little centrist independent campaign, nobody wants to hear that shit. So I don't know where this leaves the rest of the 2020 field. And for what it's worth, as long as we're talking about the 2020 field, um, Bill Weld has announced that he plans on primarying Trump as a Republican. So there's that. I guess this my my LP 2020 prediction has been officially blown out of the water. And I don't know, maybe maybe my Dem 2020 nomination prediction has been blown out of the water because at this point, like I don't really know who beats Bernie, like. If you're going to ascribe to the craziest motherfucker in the room theory, which I do, I don't know who's going to out crazy Bernie because Bernie's been crazy for a long fucking time and these people have not been. So maybe we will end up with the matchup that everybody wanted in 2016, which was Bernie and Trump, which 
would be hilarious on a certain level. Like, after everything, after all of the screeching about women and youth and minorities, if what we end up with on stage for 2020 presidential debates is two old, rich white men from the Northeast, that is going to be hilarious. Like, that is the biggest repudiation of everything that has happened since 2015. And that's what a lot of people are scared of, I think. there's, I think that's where a lot of the Bernie backlash is coming from, is they don't want that to happen, because then it pretty much invalidates everything that you've been trying to do. Like, if after all this you end up with some old, rich, white dude as your candidate, like, what did you do? Like, what did you accomplish? Oh yeah, you accomplished nothing. So, that will be interesting to watch going forward. Um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. So, as always, if you did make it this far, thank you for listening. And if you did like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care, and until next time.